Economists tend to focus on things that can be measured. Dignity is hard to measure. A sense of self is hard to measure. Belonging is hard to measure. A feeling of transcendence is hard to measure. Mattering, that, that you are important, that people look to you. They're about the life well lived, and they're not about getting the most out of your money. They're not about what the interest rates are next week. And economists truthfully have virtually nothing to say about these things. Economist Russ Roberts is well known for his extraordinary gift at finding creative ways of communicating the power of free market capitalism to the general public. Bread eaters will rejoice when they see that every bakery is filled with so much choice. He's the host of the wildly successful podcast Econ Talk, which has been cranking out weekly episodes since 2006. I hope our listeners find it fascinating too. If you do find this interesting, please send an email to me, Russell Roberts. He's the author of two novels. The Invisible Heart, an economic romance, is one of those classic boy meets girl stories. But in this case, the boy's an economist, so it's kind of a handicap. You know, it evokes all the classic love stories of the past involving economists. I can't think of any either. And along with filmmaker John Popola, he created the blockbuster Kane's Hayek rap videos. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. I made my case ready. H, listen up. Can you hear me? More recently, his interest has turned to the fundamental inadequacy of his chosen discipline to comprehend what matters most to people. Robert's new book is called Wild Problems, and it deals with the decisions that define us, whether to marry, whether to have kids, what kind of work to pursue. He says these are the sorts of central questions that can't be figured out with economic modeling and cost-benefit analyses. Reason talked with the 68-year-old Roberts about how he makes sense of a world that is richer than ever in material resources and yet suffers increasing numbers of deaths of despair. We discuss his own life, from earning a PhD in economics at the University of Chicago in the 1970s to starting Econ Talk, to becoming president of a private liberal arts college in Israel, to the central role that religion plays in his life. Russ Roberts, thanks for talking to Reason. Great to see you again, Nick. It's been All a right. long time. It has been, uh, but uh, the new book is Wild Problems. Uh, give me the elevator pitch. So the elevator pitch is that there are a number of aspects of our lives, big decisions we face, that we'd like to have data and evidence and make a rational, logical decision about them. These are decisions like whether to have children, whether to marry, who to marry, what career to pursue. And there's not that many uh, pieces and of evidence. And if I that may, I in the case of Francis Bacon, who comes up, whether to marry a child. <laughs> Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, I learned a little too much about yeah. Francis Bacon in this book. Um, uh, this is a man who said, uh, if you marry, you became a hostage to fortune. Mm -hmm. And by fortune, he did not mean uh, riches. Yeah. He meant the randomness of life. Um, luck, good luck, bad luck. So he said, once you marry, you're a hostage to fortune. He married late in life and he um, well, married he a Well, he was very late in person. life. Yeah, yeah he was, was 45. Not, no. She is 14 plus or yeah. minus six months, right? We but don't he even saw know. Her, but he saw her. He had his eye on her since she, when she was 11. Yeah. yeah. They didn't have the best relationship. It's Let's like just leave the it that. Enlightenment's version of Georgie Girl or something. It's just, it's uh, a very disturbing scenario. It's a British but film, right? It is a British film. Yeah. With <laughs> good, uh, good Sir illusion. James Mason. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, Francis Bacon is also, and we're getting ahead of ourselves as always, but uh, he's one of Hayek's enemies. Uh, he's like an epistemological enemy of Friedrich Hayek, who thought that Bacon kind of ushered in all that was wrong about enlightenment thinking and scientism and whatnot. But mm -hmm. Maybe to come back, wild problems are problems that uh, that resist measurement, uh, yes. you say. And so talk about uh, and you, you do spend a lot of time early on talking about like, OK, how you know, how do you make a decision whether or not to get married? And Charles Darwin, even more than Bacon, is kind of your, you know, one of the one of the textbook cases you work through. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about that and how that kind of explains the larger set of issues that you're trying to get at with wild problems. So I use Darwin as an example because I think most people would agree he is perhaps the greatest scientist of all time. Okay, maybe second or third if you're a skeptic about that, but he's clearly a rational person. Uh, and I use a number of scientists and analytical thinkers and academics who struggle 
with these kind of decisions that we're talking about because they're used to using analytical thinking uh, in the rest of their life. But when it comes to these kind of decisions, they're kind of uh, uh, unmoored at sea. And so Darwin tries to do what most economists or other people would say is rational. And you'll get this advice all the time. Make a pro con list, make a list yeah. of the costs and the benefits and weigh them and and see what's the right choice. And he does that. He makes a list. It's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> he compares horribly embarrassing. Uh, he says coming home to a wife would be better than a dog, at least. Um, kind of a low bar for, for a spouse. <laughs> I just um, saw all the dogs must have been like, ah. Oh. God, gosh, again. Yeah. <laughs> so his list is pretty depressing. Uh, he's worried he'd have to spend time with her relatives. He doesn't have anybody in mind, by the way. This is a generic wife as far as, as the <laughs> list goes. So he's worried he might not get along with the relatives. He's worried she might want to leave London. He'd have to live in the countryside. Yeah. He's worried he won't have time for his work. He's worried they'll have children and while that might be a comfort in old age, he says they also might get sick a lot, which of course they do. They might die, which of course they do in his time quite depressingly often. And so he basically, if you look at his list, you'd say, well, this is a no brainer. Don't get married. This is, the pros are, are way inferior to the cons. I was thinking from Mrs. Darwin's perspective, look at that list and say like, don't get married. This guy, <laughs> I don't know. Bad news. Yeah. Uh, you can do better. Yeah. He, he ends up marrying his cousin. Um, so I guess his rel her relatives are actually his relatives. I mean, that was part of his strategy. <laughs> but but uh, he doesn't make a rational choice. Something else is at play. And my suggestion is, is that these kind of decisions, marriage, whether to become a parent, uh, what kind of career to pursue, mm -hmm. where you live, how much time you devote to friendship, these are all quote, problems, challenges we face as human beings in, in the modern world, where we really don't have enough information to make a rational mm -hmm. decision. And more importantly, they don't just lead to a set of pleasant or not pleasant day-to-day -day experiences. They also define who we are. They are crucial to our sense of self, our identity, and these kind of factors, you can put them into the cost-benefit list, mm -hmm. but they're essentially incommensurate with the kind of day-to-day -day things that Darwin's talking about. So, you know, I joke around and say, okay, let's put him in. Become the greatest scientist of all time or have someone to come home to. Oh, yeah. wouldn't that be nice? Uh, pleasant chat, you know, she, maybe she'll play the piano. Um, so that's one factor, right. which is that the things that really count are, don't necessarily come to mind. And if they do, you're not sure how to take them into account. The second part of it is that he has no idea about the costs and benefits of getting married because he's never been married right. and it takes the leap of faith to become married before he'll realize that the life with an, a life with another person has a different texture it's not just oh it's nice to have somebody around to come home to you see yourself as a different kind of person it changes the way you look at the world it changes the way you experience the world so in the jargon of an economist it changes your utility function it changes mm -hmm. your preferences and it can be exhilarating, it can be hellish, it depends on who you marry, who you are. But the point is, is that the idea of making a rational decision in that environment is kind of a joke. Right. And Darwin knew it. He, you know, he makes this pro con list and then he writes this stream of consciousness paragraph about how horrible how horrible it would be to come home to a dingy apartment and oh, okay, marry, 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 he right. decides. And wait a minute, in the calm, sober light of day, you made a list and it looked overwhelmingly that you should not marry what what went on there why, why did the, a great scientist make this crazy quote irrational decision i would argue it's not irrational he understood that there was more at stake than the day-to-day -day pleasures that he was i call it narrow utilitarianism right. uh, he knew there was more to life than that and he made a decision accordingly and so what the book is about is going back to the elevator pitch mm -hmm. uh, and now four minutes into it, probably it was a total failure. So I'm very on the, the, uh, <laughs> you know, we're stuck in the yeah. elevator got stuck before between the second and third floors. So. Excellent. So what the book's about is that, okay, there's no easy way to make a rational decision. So what do you do now? Right. Mm, go with your gut, uh, flip a coin, uh, ask your friends what you should do and let them decide for you. And so the book is about the fact is about the reality that most important decisions of our lives, and there are only about maybe five to 10 of these in the course mm -hmm. of our lives, 
because they define us, we should treat them differently than what we're going to right. do Saturday night, whether we go to a movie or have go to a party or stay home and read. Yeah, one thing I know I'm not doing is going over to the Darwins because <laughs> that woman won't stop with the piano. You know, I'm just going to stay home with dogs. But you you write at one point that the, these are, you know, parts of life are outside uh, outside the reach of science and the scientific method. I'm paraphrasing a little yeah, bit. That's First, right. um, you know, is, you know, and, and you talk about Darwin. We mentioned Bacon, who is, uh, you know, I guess less well known than he used to be. But I mean, he really is one of the super geniuses at the beginning of the Enlightenment. Um, and these are people who put us on the path to a kind of scientific worldview or a rationalist worldview where we're, we're explaining why we're doing things. And we're at least pretending that we're bringing the human mind to bear on the, these things around us. Right. I mean, yeah. this is what kind of the Enlightenment is about. Is it an overstatement to say that? I mean, like in your world and you, you know, you're an economist, um, you know, people try to do this, but. Is it true that we live in a radically kind of rationalized universe where people are always making these kinds of lists or, you know, I mean, has that reached, you know, 100 percent penetration of, of everyday life? I mean, a lot of people would call themselves rationalists. Uh, they want to use their analytical faculties to mm -hmm. make the best decisions they possibly can. Not a bad idea. Not a bad starting place. Uh and if I said to you, um, we could start with Bacon, you could go to Darwin, we could go to Einstein. And I say, you know, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to develop a device that would help me find the quickest route from uh, A to B. Mm -hmm. And um, as brilliant as those people are and were, uh, they could not imagine a smartphone that would have Waze or Google mm -hmm. Maps on it. Right. That's an extraordinary culmination of the application of the analytical, scientific, rational way of thinking to a human problem. And it's really a, an extraordinary achievement that, you know, once it's in place, we totally take it for granted. If your smartphone dies when you're trying to get somewhere, it's not like, oh, well, I'll just have to do the best I can. It's panic. Right. right. We become extremely dependent on many aspects of that extraordinary technology. And in that sense, those kind of achievements are the pinnacle of the enlightenment way of thinking you're talking about. Right. And I would argue that as extraordinary as the progress uh, that has been made on that problem, uh, which is a, a, an incredibly impressive, that takes account of traffic and the other users and how many people are on the road. I mean, it's ex amazing. We've made no progress on whether we should go from A to B. Right. <laughs> Once we decide to go from A to B, we can find the quickest route there and we use technology and algorithms and spreadsheet, devices. Weighted spreadsheets, yeah, all of exactly. this kind of stuff. Yeah. But the crucial big parts of life, we haven't, they're not really touched by this way of thinking. And I use the phrase, you know, the I talk about the 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 person coming home from the party who can't find their keys mm -hmm. and they're looking under the street light and a person comes along to help them. And finally the person helping says, you sure you lost him here? Oh no, but the light's better here. So that's where right. I look. Yeah. And we naturally look for those kind of things that we're used to that illuminate things, but these other problems are not easily illuminated and they're certainly not easily illuminated by technology. So let me uh, uh, dial in on, a little bit on this. At, at one point you write, um, the fact that choice choice offers potential for a better life. And, you know, we live in an age of increasing choice, both banal and, and deep, uh, you know, yeah. so, and, and for me, you know, speaking as a small L directional adjectival libertarian, you know, I find this absolutely true. And it's also kind of terrifying. We more people all over the globe now have more choices, which is both great and kind of terrifying. And then you also write a little bit later in the book that uh, to flourish as a human being is to live life fully. So this is getting to that question of we don't know, you know, we maybe know where point A is because that's where we're standing, kind of, but we don't know where point B is. Can you kind of talk a little bit about, you know, why choice is important? And then also when you say to flourish as a human being is to live life fully, what are you getting at there? Well, I make the argument that through most of human history, many of these things that we struggle with today were not choices. Right. 
you, you didn't think about whether you're going to get married. If somebody would take you, oh, yeah, of course you get married. Yeah. Well, uh, you were just where, told, right? Like yeah, you're, exactly. You're getting your, married. Yeah. yeah. And here it is. Here she is. Here he mm -hmm. is. And certainly with children, same thing. Nobody yeah. said, eh, should I have children? What about climate change? Yeah. Most of human history, you had a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, for, for, and not simply because technology made that inevitable, the lack of technology, right. but because people wanted them. They yeah. wanted to have them for the farm, whatever, the, for their old age, for sec right. security. Or just because they knew, you know, half of them or a third of them probably were going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. So all these things. Uh, what, what, I what mean, even Adam, even Adam had multiple kids, right? Yeah, so it's exactly. Like he, he knew he was going to have a couple of bad apples or at least one. Yeah, one maybe. Um, and your career, you did what your what yeah. your dad or mom did. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have much of a choice. So all these things, as the as time has passed through the millennia, the centuries, the decades, we that all of those choices have opened up. They're now choices rather than I say destiny. They're not yeah. destiny; they're choices. Amazing, fantastic, yeah. but really scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't think we're well equipped to deal with that uncertainty. We don't like it. It makes us uncomfortable. We look yeah. for ways to mitigate it. We look for help and we convince ourselves that if I get a little more data, if I date this person a little more longer, I'll, I'll know for sure. And right. unfortunately it often doesn't help. And more importantly, it's often just an excuse to avoid making a decision. So you make a decision in fact, by default. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's the question. And then the, the question about flourishing and living more fully, I, I think, it's ironic. Freedom allows us the opportunity to flourish in ways we couldn't before. If you had to be a blacksmith because your dad was a blacksmith and you couldn't get into another guild and you couldn't apprentice to anybody you wanted. So you're a blacksmith mm -hmm. and you're not, turns out you're not built like your dad. You're not as strong. You're a scrawny person. You're not going to be a you're great blacksmith. You're describing yourself right now. Exactly. You realize that, right? Yes, exactly. And you're stuck. Your father was a blacksmith and you ended up <laughs> as an economist and a president of a university that we'll get into. But it's yeah, good you had that choice. But think about it. I, yeah, I had that choice. Yeah. But in, most of the time in the past, right. if flourishing required you to be an economist and you're stuck with being a blacksmith, life wasn't so thrilling or yeah. fulfilling or meaningful. And I think we have opened up this glorious opportunity to choose your path. Mm -hmm. And I think we have not gotten good yet at thinking about how do I choose that path? And, just... and if I may, uh, you know, like to just to kind of uh, emphasize how recent a lot of this is, I, my grandparents uh, on my mother's side, they were from Italy, they were born in Italy in the 1890s, had an arranged marriage. Uh, you know, and they should, you know, they it was consummated or whatever. And I like around 1915 or something. And so like essentially a hundred years ago, yeah. you know, there were people and that was not uncommon. I mean, they were, they had moved to the U S but and there, this there is cultures a, today. That's still yeah, true. Right. But it, it is the rapid onset of this massive uh, bad word choiceification, but like, obviously a lot of people are still living in dire, almost pre-modern states, but you know, what we have seen is a mass movement towards the world you're living in, and, and we're not good at it yet. It's we easy. haven't you know, developed. People, people like to make the point, oh, you know, we evolved in a on the savannah yeah. where a slightly sweeter peach was heaven. And so we have this sweet tooth that we're stuck mm -hmm. with, and now we have Skittles and M&Ms mm -hmm. and, and Hershey's, and we can't handle it because we're not evolutionary prepared for it. Right. That's not what this is about. This is about the fact that culturally we're not prepared for it. Yeah. And I think cultural norms, you know, are very much in flux in all these, most mm -hmm. of these areas. And it'll be interesting to see how they turn out. But my book's really about given the reality that these are hard choices and it's, they're not easily made with data or evidence. What do you do? And my suggestion is you should think about a variety of things other than what is going to make me happiest day to day mm -hmm. based on my choice. You should also think about meaning, purpose, your principles, and aspiration. You should think about who you want to be, who you mm -hmm. want to become, and not just who you are now. In the economist world, you have what's called a utility function, a set of preferences, and your job is like a, it's a mathematical problem. How do I get the most pleasure with my limited amount of income and time? I don't think that is the fun. That's an interesting way to describe what it's like to be in a shopping mall 
mm-hmm. or in a grocery store, I don't think that's a helpful way to think about life. Uh, and part of the reason is because who you are, what you care about, what's important to you, what floats your boat, what gives you meaning and purpose, it's going to be different in 20 years. And right. you're going to have to discover what that is. And you need to invest in that and not merely do what's fun. And Can't, so a, a sub theme of the book is fun is overrated. Right. <laughs> and and you also, you at one point talk about uh, why you should choose principles over narrow gains or, or narrow utilitarianism, like what what's good for you right now, or seems to be. Talk about where, where do you generate those principles for that kind of long-term investment to guide, okay, you know, uh, to be thinking about 10 years from now, 20 years from now, recognizing you're planning for a person you may not recognize. Yeah. Um, and of course ha- you won't um, to some extent, if you're, if you're alive, uh, you know, I think there are people who don't change much over the course of their life. Um, don't aspire, don't try to grow. Um, what I suggest in the book is you need to And discover- now you're talking about your other family members, right? Your siblings, <laughs> uh, you know, that uncle. I read yeah. everything as as autobiography, so that's <laughs> funny. That's how I get through the day. It helps me. It's very comforting, yeah. isn't it? Um, no, I've totally lost my train of thought, Nick. You're that cheap. I'm shot. sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no. So, um, uh, yeah. You, well, you were saying uh, many people don't change over the course right. of and their so life. Right. And so, what I what I suggest is that it's not a bad idea to invest in discovering and exploring what it's like to be part of something larger than yourself. Mm-hmm. That you're not just the center of the universe. I suggest. There's religion, there's meditation, there's psychotherapy, there's literature, there's friendship. There are all kinds of ways that we can help get out of ourselves and to see ourselves from a different perspective rather than just right. me, me, me. Yeah, now, you say again, uh, you exhort people to get over yourself Yeah, uh, in, in, in explicitly in that phrase. Kind of a Nietzschean way. I'm not much of a Nietzschean, but right. uh, you know, I think, I don't remember if I quote him or not, but he says uh, at some point... Um, man is meant to be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? Yeah. Uh, meaning, well, and you say live your life as an artist or as, as a kind of work of art, which is a very Nietzschean uh, phrase. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the idea there is that you craft yourself mm-hmm. just the way an artist crafts a, a work of art. And we tend to think of artists as having a big a plan and chiseling away at the marble until David's revealed mm-hmm. in Michelangelo's case. When in fact, uh, often art changes as the process of making the art is is right. is done, and I think life is similar is so is a similar process, and I think it's helpful to think about it that way. How um, uh, you know this this book? I mean, a lot of your work is is very Hayekian um, to me because it is about looking for patterns. It's about kind of setting general coordinates and then exploring rather than coming to predetermined conclusions and things like that. Um, Part of the way, not simply because of your criticism of Francis Bacon early on in the book, but um, later you are um, kind of, at at various points, you also talk about using literature and art as a way of kind of being able to inhabit past versions of things or to kind of simulate different, you know, scenarios that you would want to be. And I think it's in the counter revolution of science that Hayek talks about how literature is the great storehouse of wisdom, literature, not history per se. Um, can you talk a bit about how, you know, how to, how to, what are ways to avail ourselves? Like, you know, it's one thing to experience something and that, you know, is the most direct way of understanding whether or not it's for you or not, but you know, learning from other people's experiences as they recount them is really important. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that in your life? What What do you read? What do you, uh, you know, kind of wrap yourself up in that allows you to think in a different way than, you know, where you're from and, and what you've experienced so far? So, you know, Darwin, again, is uh, an interesting example. I make the claim, I think it's undeniably true, that he couldn't have known much about marriage um before he was married he probably had married friends who he hung out with he saw something of married life but he didn't understand or appreciate the inner life of a married person which can be glorious or hellish again we, right. we as i mentioned earlier that inner life is veiled from most of us in our conversation with our friends i su- i suggest that married people don't like to talk about their marriage they may feel it's mm-hmm. inadequate are embarrassing. 
And even if they wanted to, they might struggle to find the words. These are somewhat ineffable things. Mm -hmm. And literature is a way where a really great writer can give you a window into, into marriage. A great movie can give you a window into marriage or love or friendship. And as you talk, as you mentioned, it's, it, it kind of simulates the imaginary um, inner life that, that you might want to experience. So in my case, um, you know, I've read a lot of bad fiction in my time, bad meaning lowbrow. Mm -hmm. And I've read, oh, I don't know, a few hundred mysteries. Um, it was just, um, that's snack food. I enjoyed mm -hmm. it. It was fun. But we think about, quote, real literature. I think what makes real literature powerful is not because it's a page turner, that not what we might be talking about, because it forces you to confront an aspect of yourself or of others, or how you interact with others, or marriage, or being a parent, or a child, that you otherwise would not focus on. Um, I recently read A uh, Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls, mm -hmm. which I think is a masterpiece. Um, that is the portrait of a life well lived. And you might not agree, you might think there's things that are you know, appalling about the main character, or you might just enjoy this, the story, it's a fantastic story. But I think if you think about it as a, a manual for life and how to face hardship, mm -hmm. uh, disappointment, constraints, um, the fact that the world you inherited is suddenly falling to pieces below your feet, these are all deep things. And for me, it's all, um, and I love the phrase of Faulkner's from his Nobel Prize address. He says, you know, great art is the is about the human heart in conflict with itself. Yeah. And and what could be a better uh, um, antagonist to the economist's view of rationality? In the economist's view of rationality, you have a set of preferences, and your job is to get the most out of them, of the limited amount of money you have or the limited right. amount of time. And uh, Faulkner is saying uh, most of life, the really hard part, is about the fact that you're not sure what you want. Right. And uh, a lot of what my book's about is about you should think about that. You should think about what you want, not just. Uh, what, excuse me, you should think about what you want to want. You should right. think about what you care about. And if you don't care about something now, you could come to care about it if you worked at it, if you wanted to. Uh, you know, let's let's talk uh, less about the book right now and more about your kind of your career uh, or, or your your journey, because you are not just an economist. You you graduated. Uh, your PhD is from the University of Chicago, uh, which is famous for economistic thinking. Right. This is, you know, this is the school of academics who reduce everything in human life to spreadsheets or to cost benefit analyses. You worked in particular with the uh, Nobel Prize winning. I was going to say Academy Award winning, the Nobel Prize winning economist Gary Becker, who. One of the great insights that he did is that he applied basic economic reasoning to all aspects of life and illuminated things like the family uh, from an economic perspective. When did you start to feel that the Chicago view was inadequate to kind of cover what it meant to live a, a life well lived? That's really interesting. I, th I think there are two pieces to it. Um, there's probably more than two, but yeah. two that stand out when I think about it. Um, the essence of that Chicago toolkit, part of its measurement that you're talking about, but the yeah. other part is assuming that two things, that people pursue their self-interest rationally and that markets coordinate the different desires of people very effectively. And that first part, the, the rational part, you know, I used to, on the first day of class, I would say, we're going to assume in here that people are rational. They act in their own self-interest. It doesn't mean they don't make mistakes, but we assume they learn from their mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, some people get divorced. Some people buy things they don't like, of course, in the real world. But our starting point will always be that we that people know what they want better than anyone else from the outside and that they work systematically at fulfilling their desires given their limited income. And it's a very powerful toolkit. Mm -hmm. And I, I can tell you 50 things that are fantastically interesting and provocative and possibly even true when you apply that idea to the real world. And that's the gift of economics. Mm -hmm. But at some point I realized um, it doesn't exactly work like that a lot of the time at the personal level 
and that economists fundamentally actually have come to many and come to believe that it does. <laughs> so so the, the, they'll say, and markets therefore, but they forget that what is underlying the market is a bunch of decisions that individuals are making that are not quite as rational as the model. Right. And that's okay. I would have said, yeah, fine. So what? It doesn't justify government intervention because the government doesn't understand what right. people want either. But the problem is, is that Again, I think a lot of people who are trained in economics, including myself for a bunch of my career, which is what you're alluding to, sort of said, took this not just as, oh, this is useful, but this is truth. Right. And I think when I started to read um, Hayek and learn about emergent order, I realized uh, you know, my former colleague and friend, my current friend, Don Boudreau, would say mm -hmm. that. You know, I'm somewhere between Chicago and Vienna. I'm somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mix of Chicago and, and Austrian You're economics. You're sinking with Atlantis, right? Somewhere. <laughs> no, I'm walking on water, water, baby. Okay. No, um, that I'm somewhere over the, over the Atlantic Ocean because I'm not really a Chicago economist anymore, but I still have some of that in me. Yeah. That and it is tempers... a, a, a massively powerful set of tools. Oh, I mean, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and and so and and so is the Hayekian and Austrian yeah. insights about the complexity of reality and the mm -hmm. connections between many things and so on. And I'd like both of those toolkits. They're both yeah. extremely powerful and useful, and they're closely related, even mm -hmm. though the proponents like right. to emphasize the differences. And and so, even but, many people, I I don't want to say they're left wing, but say centrist uh, economists or liberal economists, people like Paul Krugman, you know, who might criticize the Chicago School, he essentially buys into. A oh, similar sure. model, right? I mean, he's a so, mainstream. Yeah, he's yeah. a mainstream economist um, in in every sense. But yeah. what happened to me? The other part that happened to me, I think, has to do with the um, the world falling apart around 2015. Mm -hmm. and around 20, it's an arbitrary date, uh, and a lot of people would say, "Yeah, it's it's when, once Trump got elected." Right. You know, my view is that Trump is a symptom, not a cause. Yeah. Uh, the world got very different starting around 20 somewhere in the aftermath of the financial crisis between 2008 and 2016, the things that economists were interested in suddenly became dramatically less interesting to the world. Mm -hmm. And forced, that forced me to think about whether I was a little too focused on them. So just to take an example of tribalism, mm -hmm. economists have nothing to say about tribalism. Gary Becker, were he alive today, I'm sure could write a fabulous paper on it that would give us some insights. But most economists nothing to say about it. In fact, it's somewhat irrational what you're going to prefer right. your identity as a member of this tribe, whether it's the American tribe, your Catholic tribe, your um, economist tribe. I mean, the, the you, amazing ones are, I, I think about it, you know, people who are neo-Confederates or neo-Nazis who, yeah. why would you affiliate with such obvious losers? But people do, right? Yeah. And, and they would say, you don't understand. Yeah, they might be. And, and they I, might and be I, I don't. I yeah. I mean, a lot of nobody understands why somebody chooses the wrong tribe, right? Correct. And of course, many of the tribes that we feel connected to, we don't choose. Right. You're born in a certain place. I, and I certain... do. I realize you're fishing for this. I do want to bring up your mm -hmm. uh, love of Bill Belichick and the uh, New England Patriots, a, a tribe also. Where, you know, just it's irrational, but. Yeah, but, uh, you're, but you're saying that you know economists on a certain level can't explain many human patterns or or why people act the way they do because it's not and this isn't to say it's bad or invalid but it does it is not rational in the way that they define rationality. But it's more than that because somewhere along the line, I came to realize that economists, consciously or not tend to focus on things that can be measured. Right. And this ties in back to the book. Dignity is hard to measure. Uh, a sense of self is hard to measure. Belonging is hard to measure. A feeling of transcendence is hard to measure. Mattering that, that you are important, that people look to you. These are things that I think are, coming back to your question, they're about the life well lived. Mm -hmm. And they're not about getting the most out of your money. They're not about what the interest rates are next week. And economists truthfully have virtually nothing to say about these things. And it came to my mind that these are not unimportant. These are really yeah. important. And the reason it came to mind, you know, I'm toiling in the vineyard. I'm having a good time thinking about economics or the minimum wage or labor markets or social security. And it suddenly dawned on me somewhere around 2015 that 
nobody else cares about this except other economists, mm-hmm. right? So the standard fiscal and monetary policy, free trade, something I care deeply mm-hmm. about, had cared deeply about for a long time. You know, you start to make the case for free trade and people are saying, right, but the people who are left behind, their lives aren't meaningful anymore. Oh, but the gains to the... It's like, yeah, yeah. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's the way the economist deals with the fact mm-hmm. that sometimes trade imports are hard for people. And I've had that. In, I mean, I've worried about that for a long time. That economist right. view, I think, is really bad. But it suddenly dawned on me that the, the... Not suddenly. It came to me that after a while that the economist focus on the observable and the measurable and the tangible was missing um 99% of the iceberg was below the surface. So, the, and so yeah, the I mean there. the economist here is the drunk looking for his keys around the exactly. the lamppost at night. Exactly. <clears throat> um can I ask if you know in a way there's you know the fun, the 21st century has been a weird you know, 20 years, right? Um, And in many ways, you know, financially or or materially, we're better off. Certainly more people on the planet are better off than ever. But there's this anxiety about, is all of this going to go away, including is the planet going to go away, you know, because of global warming or something like that? Is it, you know, possible that the economics and the the kind of economics that you, you were raised into and became a master of was really kind of geared around a world of scarcity, that doesn't quite exist in the same way anymore. Uh, because even if people are like, okay, it's really expensive to buy a house now or whatever, or, or and I'm going to pretend I don't want to have kids because they're so expensive. In fact, we're, we're past all of that. And people have so many choices that mere economics doesn't speak to, you know, where they are at life or where we are in society, certainly in the developed world. Well, I think that's a different way of saying what I was trying to get at before. Um, When I used to hear people complain about economic insecurity or inequality, I would say, you know, people are worried about these things, but the data actually, and you can, you can find evidence for those worries that, that make them seem reasonable, but there's evidence on the other side, actually, that says what you've suggested is the greatest time to be alive materially Mm -hmm. for an enormous number of people. Uh, it's unparalleled in human history. And so why are people so unhappy, stressed out? Why is suicide rising among young people? And and the economist is like my, I would say it differently, free market economists who think things are pretty good tend to say things like, well, the media is always telling a depressing mm-hmm. story. And of course, there might, there's something to that. But I do think uh, that a lot of people find the material their material well-being unsatisfying Mm -hmm. which is troubling to the economics worldview the economist worldview there are things that people care about besides uh how much what a nice car they can have nothing wrong with a nice car nothing wrong with a great phone nothing wrong with a great vacation nothing wrong with a nice house they're all lovely uh but many many people are finding themselves going this is it this is all there is um something's missing yeah. What is that? Uh, economists don't have anything to say about. It. Now, again, we can build a model of despair, a model of angst. We could, we're really creative, but it's not the heart of the economist toolkit or enterprise. And um, what it, are the a, what are the social either social sciences, and maybe it's it's wrong because all social sciences, uh, you know, even if we talk as if economists and sociologists and psychologists are mortal enemies, they're all kind of working in a similar you know, epistemological worldview of, you know, rational analysis and, you know, incentives, behavior, all of that kind of stuff. What what are the bodies of knowledge that um, you think speak to this sense of, you know what, like, I, you know, I, I'm unhappy. I, I'm, I, you know, I have a thousand thread count sheet that, <laughs> you know, I cry into my pillowcase every night. Yeah. Um, what are the you know, what are there organized schools of thought or, you know, where, where do we look for wisdom, you know, that might help us deal with those questions? Well, I think social science has something to say about those things. Uh, economists, sociologists, and psychologists, I'm not sure they're all working in the same vineyard. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the psychologists and the sociologists are much more likely to invoke irrationality or mistakes mm-hmm. or uh 
prejudices, biases. Yeah. Economists have gotten into that in the last right. 10, 15 years, quite a bit, actually. And they've mm-hmm. tempered their certainty about rationality in creative ways. I don't know if it's helpful or not. It's interesting. Um, but I think if we want to look to those, to understanding ourselves, we do have to go to wisdom. And there's not that much wisdom in psychology, economics, and sociology. Uh, I, I would look to the great minds of the past that have stood the test of time. You know, I would read Tolstoy. I would read the Bible. I would read uh, Don Quixote. And I would read Dostoevsky and um, Faulkner, et cetera, and great so poets. All these and, incredibly upbeat yeah, uh, sure. You know, Hollywood ending type. Guy. I mean, they invented the Hollywood ending, right? That's the yeah, Anna Karenina. Oh, sure. Or Dostoevsky, sure. Um, no spoilers here. Um, but I, it's funny because so much of our culture disdains the ancient. Mm-hmm. Our culture wants the newest, the latest, the best, the quickest, the fastest, the you name it. And, um, I think a lot of those things I just reeled off, I'll add Homer in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not fashionable. Now they, they come and go occasionally someone, you know, we still put on Shakespeare, a very, very, very wise and and insightful person. But um, uh, TikTok is not the place to find wisdom. It's the place Mm -hmm. to find escape and entertainment. We live in an age of distraction rather than deep thought, deep exploration, uh, and many of us have, I think, lost the ability to do it. I'm not sure I can do it the way I, I did. I certainly can't do it the way I did when I was in graduate school to immerse myself in difficult ideas and think about them for long periods of time. And I'm easily distracted myself. So it's a hard it's a hard thing. But I think we all understand to some extent that there are deeper things that take more time that are worth investing in. Of course, when you say that, Sometimes my younger listeners on my podcast say, oh, yeah. you're just old. You yeah, no, I, I, I was going to, I have in my notes here, <laughs> boomer, you know, question mark. Uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, you, you are, according to Wikipedia, you're 67. You're about to have a birthday in September. So That's if correct. my math is correct, you'll be 68. And at one point you, uh, you name check in the same sentence, Odysseus and Mark Knopfler, really showing your boomer <laughs> roots in a way that I, I'm most, I won't even explain who Mark Knopfler is. Uh, if people don't understand, they can look it up. But um, is, I mean, are- It starts with a K, just yes. to make it easier for the Googlers. Oh, well, now, you know, now that's like 90, they're 90% of the way there. But, yeah. um, you know, how much of the journey that you're on is simply the journey of a person, you know, of a thoughtful, intellectually minded person getting older? Um, and not that, that isn't a meaningful journey. I'm like, you know, a couple of paces behind you up the mountain, but um, are you mistaking your journey for, you know, a, a, you know, a society that needs to be redeemed according to what you're going through? I think that's a, a real possibility. Uh, I think about it a lot, actually, although, you know, traditionally uh, older people get cranky mm-hmm. and uh, self-centered and ex- get tired of the niceties and just tell people what they want and tell them yeah. what they think of them. And maybe you have to be at a certain cutoff age for that to really set in. I don't think that's, that's what I'm you. talking about. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I get cranky though, occasionally, yeah. but um, I do wonder how much of it's just aging. Mm-hmm. And I wonder about whether uh, a book like this, for example, or the kind of ideas that we're talking about are things you can't enjoy till you get older. Right. You know, as I, I think I talk about it in the book. There's a wonderful play by Edward Albee called Three Women. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it's called. It's called mm-hmm. Three Tall Women, Three Women. I can't remember. I think it's Three Women. Three Women. And it's three characters on stage the whole time. And it's actually the same person, just at three different ages. It's well, a genius I thought you idea. were not doing spoiler alerts. but I think you catch yeah. it on pretty quickly on yeah. that one. And, and if you think about it, when you think about your 20-year-old self and looking at your 67-year-old self in horror, and your 67-year-old self looking back at your 20-year-old self in horror, uh, <laughs> something's going on there. And um, it very well could be the case that until you get to be 67, the kind of things I'm suggesting are important, you, you have to experience them rather than note them down and right. and live by that. You know, but a lot you of people can say, prepare what, 
for them, right? Yeah, well, but but I don't think you you can. But I'm not sure they most people want to when they're mm-hmm. trying to. You know, people there's a common theme of what do you wish you knew when you were 20? Right. And I can make a long list. You could too. Any any older person than 20 can think back and say, oh boy, there were so many things I didn't understand. So when you take a 20 year old and say, here, here are the things I wish I'd known when I was your age. Do you think that person goes, wow, thank you so much. Right. Now yeah. I don't, I can get to the truth earlier. They right. don't. I think in general, they don't. Now, some people mature quicker than others. Some people change more dramatically than others. But I, I think it's just a fascinating aspect of life that mm-hmm. um, the things we really deeply understand aren't things we read about. They're things we learn through life. Can you, can you talk about, I mean, you, you are a proponent of modernity. You are not at all like, you know, you should only read Shakespeare and, you know, we should be doing things the way we did a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. Um, so you're not at all like that, but you are deeply embedded in a religious tradition as well as an intellectual tradition. Um, and you, I mean, to me, one of the most amazing things you've done for all of the, the books that you've published that I've learned a lot from you recently, I mean, you left a comfortable gig, uh, you know, you had a very pleasant life and you became the president of a university in Israel. Um, what went into that? And can you talk about, you know, your Judaism and the way that that helps ground you, um, you know, and in a, in a certain way, it limits your your choices, right, or your options. Uh, but in another way, it also helps clarify what's important or, you know, it gives you a kind of compass to kind of figure out what direction to be heading, heading in. Yeah, it's a nice way to say it, by the way, rather than saying, as I think many people look at, at the religious life as Oh, now you have to you don't have to worry about anything because all the decisions are made for you. Hmm. Uh, that is not what the religious life is. And it's also not the case that you don't have any doubts. I think people who aren't religious mm-hmm. look at religious people sometimes and think, well, they're 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 not anxious about anything because they've they have faith. But right. it's faith. Uh it's tricky. Um so the question you're asking is not easy answering is not easy, easy to do. Um, and I haven't thought a lot about how to put that into words. I'll, I'll try to say it a different way than maybe directly answering your question. Uh, if, if you're watching this on video, uh, you'd see a window shade behind me. And outside that window, about a mile of what, mile and a half, two miles, is the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, it's a walled city. The walls come from Crusader times. The um, most visible part of that walled city is the Dome of the Rock. Uh, a, um, a mosque that I think was built, I want to say around 600. I'm not apologize if I got that wrong. Uh, it's also the same spot that um, the Temple of Solomon was built. Uh, it was destroyed around 70 uh, in the common era. So centuries before the building of the Dome of the Rock. Um, in a way, it's the center of the spiritual universe. The poet Yehuda Amichai, the Israeli poet, said Jerusalem is a port city on the sea of eternity. Mm. Now, that's a line from a poem. It's a pretty good line. That's great. To try to capture what it's like to look out over that tiny, tiny little, it's a, it's the old city of Jerusalem. You, when you're looking at it from my window, you can put your hand over it. And it's mm. gone. And yet it remains a fulcrum of many, many things today. To be connected to that is what I would struggle to put into words. Mm. You, you talked about being grounded in an old tradition. I am grounded in that tradition. I uh, last month, this is crazy, but you know, last month the Jews observed uh, what's called Tisha B'av, which is a the ninth of Av, the Jewish month of Av, uh, that, that commemorates a tragedy of the destruction of the temple that once stood on that spot. Uh, Jews still fast on that day. Uh, Two thousand years later, we still mourn the loss of that physical structure. And of course, it's ideally, it's about more than that. It's about a connection to the divine and um, holiness in a physical place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's crazy. Um, I left my house that morning to go study, which is a, what people 
traditional Jews do on that morning. They study what happened that day and they, they read mournful poetry. It's a real, it's a real opera. <laughs> and um, I heard three thuds off in the distance. They were, I think, as far as I know, three Scud missiles intercepting uh, missiles coming from somewhere uh, in the West Bank somewhere. Uh, I don't know where they came from, actually, now that I think about it. I have no idea. Um, when I got to the study session, the first announcement was, uh, if a siren goes off and you need to get to a bomb shelter, here's one over here. They told us how to get to it. And there's a second one. It's a little farther, but in case it might be easier for you because the stairs are different, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's a, that's a heavy thing. It makes you think. That is connecting you to thousands of years of Jewish tradition. At the same time, you're in the middle of a bizarre uh, conflict currently between Israel and the Palestinian people. And it's intense. It's it's not um, all peaches and cream. Mm -hmm. And it's deeply meaningful at many times. Sometimes it's a nuisance and hard to deal with. And sure. And, and finally, I would just add that for me, I forget how you worded it. It was a nice wording. But for me, my connection to religious tradition is how I retain my sense of wonder and how I process things that I find fundamentally mysterious. Um, and uh, I think that's an important part of being alive. I enjoy that part a lot. And religion is the way I access it. There's many other ways. And, you know, so the chance to come here, the chance to come to Jerusalem and be a citizen of a, a state that's about to be 75 years old, which is an unimaginable turn of historic events that right. we've now, we can now put into perspective. The Jews are exiled in the year 70, never gave up the dream that they would return to the to their homeland, the, this weird little space between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. And uh, through a mainly horrifying set of events, but also some extraordinary sets of events, mm -hmm. got a state. Uh, not imaginable, and yet was imagined for millennia by Jews who wanted to have it, and they never gave up on it. So that's uh, that's a certain richness to life when you're part mm -hmm. of that. Uh, you had uh, mentioned Faulkner earlier, one of Faulkner's best known lines, and I'm going to mess it up here, but uh, in um, Requiem for a Nun, a sequel novel that he wrote, he talks about how the past isn't dead. In fact, in the South, it's not even past. How do you, because uh, this is a question so for true. wisdom, yeah. of how how do you stay rooted in a tradition that respects the past without becoming enslaved by it or, or so stuck in the past? Um, this, you know, I think for, for many people on an individual level and sometimes for societies, um, you know, that's the question. How do you acknowledge the past and how do you learn from the past and how do you revere the past without simply repeating it or not being able to move into a future that is going to be different? Great question. Um, I'm reading uh, Dara Horn's book, People Love Dead Shoes. Hmm. Catchy title. Yeah. Um, and she opens that book with a really, I think, deep insight about the difference between America and American culture and Jewish culture, at least historically. She says, American culture is always about looking to the future. American culture is who you can become. It's the American dream is, is that you're going to either be, she doesn't say rich, but that you're going to be able to, that it's the land of opportunity. Right. You're going to craft your, your own journey the way we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And the past is, it's interesting and it's good to know about, but it's the past and no one sees the founding fathers virtually no one. In America, very few Americans see the founding fathers as their ancestors, because they're mm -hmm. not. <laughs> yeah, they're not. And so the past in America, we, you know, we debate the Constitution and how much mm -hmm. sway it should have and which amendments count, and which don't. And the, the separation of powers and the wisdom or lack of it of the founders. Mm -hmm. But it's really different for Jews, because Jews people in the Bible, in theory, are our ancestors. We are mm -hmm. a people. And most Amer that's the essence. That's an amazing thing about America, is that you become an American, but they're not your people. Your people were Italian, in your case, or Jewish, right. in, in yeah. my case, or Irish. And the idea, and you're going to forge a new thing called right. you. Mm -hmm. It's very individualistic. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, Judaism is really different. Judaism is, you are part of a very long chain. 
that goes back to Mount Sinai mm -hmm. and the giving of the Ten Commandments and uh, the Exodus from Egypt. And they're not just past, as you suggest. Right. That every spring, Jews commemorate the Exodus from Egypt, and you are enjoined to to feel as if you yourself went out from Egypt. What a crazy idea. <laughs> and so Judaism, the past isn't like it's, it's hovering all the time. Right. Now, of course, if you're not careful, you live in the past, you immerse yourself in the past. You can't look forward. You can't dream. So for Judaism, the way Judaism solved that conundrum is to say redemption is possible. Of course, Christians have a different view of where right. that went. Right. They believe that that the savior has been sent and he just mm -hmm. needs to come back. Judaism doesn't believe that. But that's the way Judaism kept us, keeps Jews forward looking, the, 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 the idea of a messianic age. And in fact, you know, John Gray, fantastic philosopher who, although I don't agree with, every, you know, of course, yeah. every aspect He's of taken him. a turn to become very, I, I was a great explicator of Hayek and then kind of took a turn against modernity in, in a profound way. And, and his, in many ways, he is the antagonist, not so much of Hayek, but of, say, Steven Pinker. Right. So Stephen Pinker will say the world's getting better. And, and certainly economists say this yeah. all the time. We talked about it half an hour ago. And uh, John Gray is saying, you know, don't we still slaughter each other? Don't we still have a lot of anger inside us? Don't we still care more often about our tribe than what's right? And um, there's 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 a lot of truth to that. I don't know why I brought up John Gray. I'm not forgotten. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I mentioned him. Like, uh, whatever. <laughs> well, um in in a United States context, um, is part of the I I don't want to say despair because I think that's overselling it, but as part of the aimlessness, perhaps um, that that maybe we're witnessing again. I don't know how much of this is generational. I I you know am having a pretty successful career. You've had a fabulously successful career. We can we can kind of ruminate on this stuff when you talk to younger people. They feel you know, ripped off. They feel cheated, even though they're growing up in a world of plenty that I, I could not imagine, much less my parents or grandparents. But is it that the sense of identity and of rootedness? I'm thinking, you know, so my grandparents from Ireland and Italy came over in the 19 teens. My parents were very ethnic in their way. I was somewhat ethnic, but less ethnic. And then I have adult children now who are just American. I mean, they're they're yeah. not hyphenated. And with that comes a certain kind of universalism, but also a loss of a kind of tradition, not necessarily to continue, but to at least push back on. Um, are we, is part of what's going on in the United States, maybe, and maybe this is true in different ways throughout kind of the developed world, that those things which gave us meaning within the recent past have kind of dissipated. Um, and we haven't figured out what is the next set of principles or next set of identities that we're going to use to kind of situate ourselves in time and space and start moving forward in our lives. I think it comes back to what you said earlier. Uh, maybe I misunderstood what you said earlier, but this seems like a version of it. Greatest time to be alive, isn't it? And why are, why are people so unhappy? Um and one answer is because it's the greatest time to be alive mm -hmm. and things that were used to be a struggle and a source of meaning work, for example, are just kind of rel for many people, not everybody, but are relatively easy. Um, there's a feeling that, as you say, of aimlessness. Mm -hmm. Now, the easy statement to make that I think and many people make this statement, I, even though I'd like to make it, I don't think it's necessarily true, is that. Religion has, to a large extent, died away, and it right. and it is a source of meaning for and has been a source of meaning for for millennia. I don't think that's it. I mean, it's a piece of it, maybe for some people, mm -hmm. but, but I, I I think um, I'm not sure of the cause, but I think the you know the, my the most compelling example of this crisis that you're referring to is how we look at masks in the aftermath of the mm -hmm. pandemic or the middle of it, how is it that wearing a mask has become a source of identity? Mm -hmm. That in certain cultural parts of America, wearing a mask is a source of pride. It's a signal of virtue. It's, I took this seriously. I believed in the science. And for other parts of America, it's a sign of stupidity. 
and worse. It's a sign of, of government control or, or uh, uh, attempt to coercion. Uh, and I have my own feelings about that, which, I, which aren't important. What's important is that, could you imagine at any time in human history until today that that would be an issue that people would line up behind one or the other and, and get occasionally violent about it? Well, I'm thinking of, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm actually thinking of there were hundreds of years of European history where people killed each other over whether you believed in a covenant of works or a covenant of grace. So well, very, very mass, nice. it's kind of like, all right, that, step in the least, right direction. Yeah, at least we're just <laughs> shouting mostly at each other. But it, um, I, I agree. Um, are your kids as religious as you? Uh, somewhere along the line, I realized that um, I make this claim. I don't know if it's true, but I think a lot of parents want their kids to turn out like themselves more or less. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't like it if your kid became like a angry socialist or a fill in the blank, whatever it is that's different from Nick Gillespie. And and I I think that's a natural impulse. It's probably hardwired in us in some sense that our children right. are a legacy. And we expect them to be, if not literally clones of ourselves, the, you know, kind of clony. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I think of them differently now. I think of them as a portfolio. Uh, they're all parts of me. <laughs> Some of them have, have drawn So you had on. a bunch to minimize your risk exactly. and to spread it around. Yeah, yeah, I have four of them. This and is also all... Bill Belichick again, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, my kids are... Um, First of all, they define religious differently than I would. Mm -hmm. They've chosen their own paths. I'm proud of all of them. I love all of them. I'm not, um, it's not my job yeah. to make them turn out like me. I gave them a legacy that they can choose and will choose and they'll change over time. So, you know, the question of whether they're, whether they're religious or not is kind of a, it's not the right question. Uh, what I really care about is they take life seriously mm -hmm. and, or at least I hope they do. And I, I you know, I'm not going to judge them, but um, I think the issue there, I'll make a Hayekian point. I think there's a, as a parent, control is really appealing. Yeah. And of course, when they're young, you ha it's a really good idea. You got to keep them safe. You got to keep them away from the street you traffic. You got to mm -hmm. keep them away from the hot stove. Uh, there's a lot of things in life that a parent has to do that, uh, that are related to control. Mm -hmm. And as the children get older, you have to recognize that they are adults like you and they need to follow their own path. And, yeah. um, and um, my kids are all doing that, which is glorious. You, uh, just as a, a kind of final uh, conversation point, you, you mentioned 2015 or thereabouts as, you know, things kind of shifting in, in a big way. Uh, you're now living in Israel. So I don't, you may not have as much of an interest in kind of Amer the American scene culturally and politically, um, but I'm, I'm curious what you think about our politics. And also, uh, I was reading an interview with you or a statement where, um, you, you know, you were quoted as saying, I'm something of a libertarian and that, and that, that term comes with some baggage and some confusion. And can you define what it means to be something of a libertarian and what is the baggage and confusion? Um, and is it, becoming more confused because you've been broadly in a kind of uh, free market libertarian world for most of your career or for really all of your career. Yeah. Um, and econ talk, which is, you know, one of the longest lived podcasts, definitely you've talked to everybody, which is one of its great strengths, but you're coming from a, a kind of identifiably libertarian or libertarian ish. Uh, perspective, you know, what's your sense of where the libertarian movement or identity or set of concerns is? And, um, you know, is it is it looking at the stuff that matters, uh, do you think? Um, well, I think libertarians, somewhat like economists in general, are struggling to maintain relevance in the mm -hmm. current debate. Um, you know, that 2015 moment, you know, nationalism became a thing or not yeah. just in america around the world um immigration was suddenly more than just an economics issue it was an identity issue certainly with brexit and other issues in america related to immigration the baggage i was referring to is that i think a lot of people think libertarianism is about having the freedom to take drugs and to have a good time in life and um the the menkean 
puritanism is the you know the haunting fear that someone mm-hmm. somewhere is having a good time and we're we're on the other side. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I think that's not exactly the right quote, but that's the way I always remember yeah. it. It's close, um, and 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 that's the baggage, and I think that's unfortunate. I think just as we are free to and should be free to party and care not at all about purpose and meaning, as I was talking about mm-hmm. earlier, we're also free to embrace it. We're free right. to become charitable. We're free to start voluntary organizations that make the world a better place. And and I think people mistake often illegal for, um, excuse me, legal for desirable. Mm-hmm. I think many things should be legal that are not desirable. That, that mm-hmm. seems really hard for people. And I think that's the part of libertarianism I, I still embrace. I still believe that, that government is uh, not our collective wisdom being expressed mm-hmm. through the ballot box. But I've lost some of my dogmatic um, passion for it over, over the last five or, or so years. Mm-hmm. And that's, I don't, I haven't thought extensively about it, mm-hmm. uh, but I know it's true. I, I haven't dissected it or diagnosed mm-hmm. it in my own head. Um, you know, I'm here in Israel, we have socialized medicine. And my drugs are really cheap, my med- mm-hmm. my prescription drugs. And I, I, it's pleasant. But I do know, because I'm an economist, that one of the reasons they're cheap is they're subsidized ridiculously in America through the high prices that consumers pay, often out of pocket, but usually through third-party right. insurance and Medicare, that um, I'm a beneficiary of here now in Israel, because right. Israel negotiates a, a bargain from suppliers that if everybody did it, there wouldn't be some of those drugs. Mm-hmm. So I'm not a fool. Right. And at the same time, there are things about the American healthcare system that that I used to defend uh, that I can't defend anymore. Or I don't aspire. I don't feel the commitment I used to have to convert the, the Israeli system into a free market system. Mm-hmm. In America, I did because it, it drove me crazy when people would say, oh, what you know what proves markets don't work? The healthcare system. Right. Are you out of your mind? It's one of the most distorted government imposed yeah. set of interactions of that you could possibly imagine. It's subsidized, quantities restricted of, of doctors. There's 10,000 interventions. It's nothing like a free market. Mm. And I think we should move in a market direction in, in America. In Israel, yeah, it works pretty well. Now, I haven't had anything really wrong with me, but it works better than. I think it might work better than the crummy American system, which isn't as market oriented as we like to think it is. Right. So those kind of things are just not my passions anymore. You know, it's kind of like um, I remember when I first became uh, libertarian or intellectually public about it. You know, uh, I would talk about private roads. Say, you know, fun idea for a libertarian, and my yeah. uh, my adversary would say, oh. If we have private roads, there'd be a road leading up to everybody's house. I said, mm-hmm. you mean like the ones we like now? Right. <laughs> like because we subsidize it and because contractors who make roads are really politically powerful. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's not the best system. But eventually, I don't know about you, but that just didn't become a crucial issue for me. I would, people would say to me, are you in favor of private roads? Mm-hmm. Maybe intellectually, but it's not in my top 10 of things I think we ought to be <laughs> struggling for. I and think those... <laughs> a lot about the one of the first articles I joined Reason in the fall of 93. And one of the first articles I read about was about, you know, we need to get rid of the post office or to, you know, break its, you know, dread uh, a monopoly on first class letter delivery. And it's kind of like somewhere in the past 30 years, it's like we did that. The post office is still around and the post, you know, we're yeah. still on the hook for all the retirement and uh, capital expenses blah, blah, blah. But like, I went to the post office for the first time in a year, like two weeks ago. And I was like, God, I, you know, and it looked like 1980 or something like that, but it's like, it's not front and center because we, we have many workarounds. Like it's, it's not pressing in the same way. Yeah. It's like, uh, do you think we should privatize the national parks? Well, it might be better. Uh, That doesn't mean turn them into Disneyland. It could mean that it's held by a an environmental group or right. other other ways of running it in a decent more decentralized way but i really like yosemite it's you know it could be run better but it's okay <laughs> it's pretty good so it's not on my it's not my top five do you worry about in the united states more broadly and in, in the political scene 
Um, and I don't know how this is playing out in Israel. I mean, obviously in Europe, there is something similar, like you were talking about populism more broadly, nationalism and whatnot. Is it, um, you know, in your estimation, is it worse or is it as bad as it's been in your lifetime where, you know, there do seem to be two tribes that pull fewer and fewer people, fewer and fewer people identify as either a Republican or a Democrat or conservative or liberal. The rhetoric is more heated. Uh, violence seems to be kind of hanging out around the edges. Do you, do you think we're at a, uh, at a dangerous moment or is this just a kind of momentary, you know, gas bubble that will pass? Uh, I once heard James Buchanan, the Nobel laureate economist, say that uh, when he looks to the past, he's an optimist. When he looks to the future, he's a pessimist. So look at the future, <laughs> doesn't look so And what do you mean by that? He meant, you know, if you look to the future, it's scary. If you look to the past, it's, you know, it, it it's not that, it, it seems like a much better time. Things are going to get, this is horrible. We're going down, this is down the tubes. Right. He said, but if you look to the past, 1933, that looked a lot worse than right now. And it turned out, I mean, horrible things happened, but right. we overcame them. Nazism was defeated. The Great mm -hmm. Depression ended. We were, at, and in fact, it wasn't just, and we eventually got back to the standard of living we had in 1928. No, we went yeah. way above it. So that's the sense in which he meant that. I have to say, and again, it could be just because I'm an old curmudgeon. Uh, I don't like to think of myself that way, but mm -hmm. it does seem like, um, Things are going awry and are not going to get straightened out. And I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll give you my argument for why. It's not because, oh, it's so much worse now. It's not. Rhetoric, and I was, I was sentient in 1968. It was really bad in 1968 in terms of, of the left and right. People were, there were, there were bombings over the war in Vietnam in America. People were, died in, for political protests and, and were killed for, for political protests at, at Kent State. And in a way, this is nothing. This is like the occasional street skirmish in Portland. I mean, come on. This is... But the reason I'm worried is that I say sometimes that the veneer of civilization is thin. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we're sitting around here, we're fully dressed, where we maintain a certain civility, even when we disagree and might even yell at each other. But we don't generally hurt each other. And but deep down, we're still animals and we're prone to hurt each other. And wars eventually and and atrocities and horrible things happen throughout human history. And I don't think those are behind us. So in that sense, I think the veneer of civilization is thin. But I think there's another sense of that saying, and that is that the norms that have governed American political life for the last 250 years are unraveling. And when people say, oh, campaigning is so dirty now. Now, it was dirty in the past, and it was you could argue it was dirtier. But what has changed is that people's respect for the institutions that sustain our civilized democracy, which is a republic, not a majority rule system, but a republic, those norms are increasingly unraveling. And the reason they're unraveling is that each side thinks, if I act civilly, I'm going to get taken advantage of. That's a bad spiral. And I think that's the spiral we're in. It's driven by all kinds of reasons, social media, external events, a lack of things to, a lack of an external enemy. You can name, you know, there are a lot of theories you could give. I would, for uh, and while we do, I just want to add the actions of the people running those institutions. Yeah. Is, is a major sure. problem. Yes. And uh, I think you've all been diagnosed very thoughtfully uh, what is going wrong. We could debate what the causes are, but people generally are not going to sacrifice their own well-being for the institutions they're supposed to represent. They're looking out for themselves. Mm -hmm. That is hard to sustain. I, I, I'm not optimistic about that. Are we going to have a civil war? I don't know, but I don't think so. But I worry about it. And I, But I worry more in America that the the norms of the political system and the that underpin its civility are, are going away. And I don't think it's going to, that, that's a fixable, if you can't, if you don't have that, you're in big trouble. And I think that's what I would worry the most about. 
All right. Well, we're going to leave it there. Uh, we've been talking with Russ Roberts. The new book is Wild Problems, A Guide to the Decisions That Define Us. Russ, in reading this, you were reminding me of Neil Young or Elton John, just to go with a couple of boomer references in the 70s, where these guys just went from great album to great album to great out. Al- I mean, kept getting better. They were on a streak and like, in in a lot of ways, and I'm a huge fan of your work, including the the novels that you wrote. This, I think, is your best book. And the oh, last I- one about Adam Smith was, you know, like a phenomenal knock your socks off sort of force. But this one is better still. Wild problem. So, continued, uh, you know, success with what you're doing. But also, thank you for the provocations in this book. And, uh, you know, I. Uh, want to just say that and say thank you well thank you that's very kind it's great to talk then 